Hey, hey, hey! What's going on, guys? Uh, welcome back to another fine day of chemistry. Let's see, a couple things before we get started. Um, I hope everyone's doing okay. I know it's kind of still a crazy time. Uh, everything here at the Hills Hilt household is okay. Woke up this morning, took a look outside, and there was snow. Joy. Why do we live here, ladies and gents? Can't figure that out. Anyways, um, things are okay. Let's see, what have I been doing? Well, I've been uh, stuck inside, probably like the rest of you. Uh, yesterday, what did I do yesterday? Oh, I, I was exciting yesterday. I actually had to go to the grocery store and I saw people. Okay, yes, I did wear my mask. Uh, let's see, what else did I do? Uh, school keeps me busy, takes me pretty much all morning to make you guys lectures and make my super class their lectures. So school is really busy for me too. Uh, I work, generally I'm up at six still, and I work till usually one or two in the afternoon just on school stuff. And then I answer emails all afternoon. So school's still busy for me, just like it is probably for most of you. Uh, what are exciting things have we done here in the health household? Uh, Becky with a Q and Madeline finished a puzzle yesterday. Uh, let's see what else have I been doing? Oh, uh, I've been playing the Zelda game on my Nintendo Switch. Uh, that's kind of fun. Mm. I ran on the treadmill yesterday. That was glorious mm. yeah other than that just trying to stay healthy you know so things are okay I hope things are I think th I hope things are okay there I know some of you are frustrated with all of this but you know we it's a crazy time and we have to deal with what we're dealing with all right so what's the plan of attack for today well we're gonna go over the challenge question that was uh, from the other day uh, then we're going to talk about indicators, and then we're going to talk about uh, molar concentration of some ions, and then eventually we're going to get into what's called titration. And I do have some demo things for you today, so we'll see how things go. So let's go ahead and start with the challenge question from the other day. Write a neutralization reaction between, the, between hypochlorous acid and strontium hydroxide. So we we're talking about these neutralization reactions, or actually other reactions using table J also. But a neutralization reaction is a, a reaction between an acid and a base. And they always produce salt and water. So if you take an acid and drink it, it kills you. You take a base and you drink it, it can kill you. But if you put them together, they will neutralize each other and produce salt and water. Right. Okay, so let's go ahead and do it. So we have to start with coming up with the formulas for our acid and our base. So let's start with our acid. Now don't get confused. This is not hydro, it's hypo. Hydro tells you that it's binary. This is not binary. This is a polyatomic ion. Okay, so we're going to have to use that little trick. 8 goes to ick and ite goes to us. 8 goes to ick, ite goes to us. 8 goes to ick, ite goes to us. Well, this is an us. So this must have been an ite. So if we go to table E, we need to find something called hypochlorite. And here it is. Okay. It's CLO minus. So how do I make CLO minus an acid? Well, we crisscross it with hydrogen. This is a polyatomic. It goes in parentheses. So this one comes over here, and this one comes over here. And the formula for my acid is HClO. So there's my acid formula. All right, now we have to do strontium hydroxide. Well, it's an ionic. So we crisscross SR, which is plus two because it's in group two. Hydroxide's a polyatomic. We have to put it in parentheses. This two comes over here. This one comes over here. 
we get SR OH2. Now, in reality, neutralization reactions are just double replacement reactions. This is just double replacement. Positive of the first goes to the negative of the second. Positive of the second goes to the negative of the first. So to come up with my products, okay, we crisscross. So I have to crisscross hydrogen, which is plus one, and hydroxide, which is minus one. This comes over here. This comes over here, and we get HOH, which is what? That's my water. Could I have written H2O? Sure. I like this formula better because you can see the polyatomic ion in it. But the other one's fine too. So if you wanted to write H2O, you could have. Now, we have to come up with the salt. So now we're going to crisscross SR plus 2 with ClO minus 1. It's a polyatomic. It goes in parentheses. This comes over here. This comes over here. And we get SR parentheses ClO parentheses 2. Now we need to balance. Let's see. I think we need a 2 here and a 2 here. And I think that would balance it. So this would be my neutralization reaction. This is my water. This is my salt. Now, there's one more thing I want to remind you of before we move on. I want to look at this salt again, because this is important. Where does the cation come from? Okay. The cation of the salt always comes from the base. Where does the anion always come from? Well, here it is. It always comes from the acid. We did a problem like this, but make sure that you can work backwards. Okay. If I give you the salt, you should be able to come up with the acid and base that reacted to come up with it. Good. All right. Well, let's go on to acid base indicators. <laughs> And we're going to need reference tables today because we're going to need what's called table M. We'll need table M. So what's an indicator? These are substances that change color in different pHs. So depending on the pH that the solution that we put them in is, they will be a different color. Now what this does is we use acid base indicators to figure out the pH of a solution. Now remember, when we're talking about pH, we're talking about the concentration of H+. That's what we're talking about. How much H plus is in that solution? And indicators can tell us okay, the pH, and then we can calculate that concentration of H plus. So let's go ahead and look at table M. Here it is. It actually is a pretty simple table, but you have to be careful. Students mess this up. So if we look at table M, these are some common acid-base indicators. There are lots and 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 lots more. Okay. But these are some common ones. Methyl orange, bromothymol blue, phenolphthalein, we will use a lot of. You've already used litmus in the past. Brom crystal green and thymol blue. There are other ones. You've actually used one. Uh, we used phenol red early in the year. If you remember way back when we did our first, first lab, I think. All right, we used phenol red. Phenol red is an indicator. All right, it's not on, the, on this list, okay, but it's an indicator. So these are some indicators. Now, this is the range that they change color. This is the range that they change color. And you have to understand this is the changing point, going from one color to another. So if we look at methyl orange, if it's below 3.1, so if it's down here, okay, 
it's red. If it's above 4.4, it's yellow. Below it's red, above it's yellow. During this 3.1 to 4.4 range, in between, in this pH range, this one's a special one. Okay, in between for this one is it's orange. So it goes from red below 3.1 to orange during the change, and then at over 4.4, it is yellow. Okay, so let's look at the next one. Bromophimal blue. Bromophimal blue, if you put it in a solution, and the solution's pH is below 6, it's going to be yellow. If it's above 7.6, it's going to be blue. We do not know what it's going to do between 6.0 and 7.6. We know below is 6.0. Uh, excuse me, below 6.0 is yellow, above 7.6 it's blue. Uh, we really, we have no idea what's going to happen here. Phenolphthalein, and I'm going to show you this one in a minute. Below 8, it's colorless. Above 9, it's pink. Above 9, it's pink. Litmus paper. And you use this. You've used red and blue litmus paper. All right. So if it's below 4.5, red paper stays red. Blue paper turns red. If it's above 8.3, red paper turns blue and blue paper stays blue. During the change, okay, between 4.5 and 8.3, Red will stay red and blue will stay blue. Okay, so that'll give you what will happen here. So th that's how this table works. And you just have to be careful with it. Okay, you just have to be careful with it. So let me go ahead and show you some. Mm, let's see, how am I going to do this? Let's put this over here. Okay. So I have three different indicators. I have some phenolphthalein. This is called universal indicator solution. And then this is um, what's called uh, pH hydron paper. Okay, and it's similar to, this is just pH paper. And you've probably used this, and here's my scale. Okay, I, I'm sure we've used this. Now, phenolphthalein is actually on our reference tables All right so phenolphthalein if you put phenolphthalein in something below eight okay it's colorless if it's above nine it's pink now the universal indicator is very similar to this guy okay it will change different colors depending on the ph it's in okay so it's almost the same scale as this one okay so when we use our ph paper if it turns red, it's a pH of 1, right? pH of 6 is this orangish yellow. pH of 7 is yellow. Once we get into the bases, it turns greens and blues and then eventually a purple, right? And this universal indicator basically is the same chart here, right? So it gives us a good, it'll tell us what pH exactly it is. So what I want to do is I got some, I got some different things out so we could actually test their pH and look at it. So let's see, I want to start with distilled water. I hope you can see. Uh, okay, so distilled water. This is pure water. Okay. Uh, let's see, what should we test it with? Well, let's start with Let's start with my pH paper. So the pH paper tells us the water, if you compare it to the scale, well, it's definitely not seven. 
Okay, you would think water would have a pH of 7. This distilled water would have a pH of 7, but it doesn't. It's below 7. It's actually somewhere probably around probably 4 or 5 if we look at this. Now, why isn't the distilled water actually 7, neutral? And the reason being is that carbon dioxide from the air will dissolve into that water. And when carbon dioxide dissolves into the water, it forms carbonic acid naturally. So any water, unless we've just distilled it, any water is going to have some carbon dioxide in it, and it's going to be a little bit acidic. Okay, So water is a little acidic. Now, let's put some phenolphthalein in here. What color should it be? Well, if we look at table M, if it's below 8, it should stay colorless. So let's see what it does. And you only need a couple drops. And it does. Okay, so that works. Okay. All right. Let's try, let's see, I, I went upstairs and I got some vinegar. So this is vinegar. All right, vinegar has acetic acid in it. Okay, it's an acid. Uh, let's start with this again. See what our pH paper says. So our pH paper says we're way down here towards a pH of one with vinegar. So that's definitely an acid. We know, we already know what the phenolphthalein will do. Phenolphthalein is going to be clear because we know that it's below 8. So what will this universal indicator do? So let's put a drop of the indicator, the universal indicator in. Put two drops. Swirl it around. All right, and we get that reddish color so we're way down here in our ph range so vinegar okay, is an acid all right so i went in the fridge and i pulled some of this out this is just milk okay this is milk and i was wondering what the ph of milk was let's start with phenolphthalein just to see i'll put a drop of phenolphthalein in there uh, it doesn't look like it's changing color at all. It doesn't look like it's changing color. It's still clear in there, so that means it's got to be below 8. I wonder what my pH paper is going to say. Let's put my pH paper in here. Milk has a pH, well, it looks like it's pretty close to 7. Right, so milk has a pH color of 7. Okay, which is neutral. Mm, I don't know, let's see what this does. I don't know what it'll do with the universal indicator. We'll put some in there and see what happens. Well, it's given us that yellow color. Right, it's kind of hidden by the but it's still giving us that yellow color. So milk has a pH of 7. Uh, let's see, what should we do next? Oh, bleach. So I went over to the laundry over here next door from where I'm, where I'm giving you this lecture. You know, and I poured some bleach just to see what bleach is. Well, let's start with pH paper. Oh, look at that. We get a nice deep, uh, it's probably about a pH of 10 or 11, somewhere in here it looks like. Right? So it's pretty high, so that tells us that's a base. So what should phenolphthalein do in there? Well, if it's above 9, it better turn pink. So let's see what it does with some phenolphthalein. And there's our pretty pink color. Right? So that's definitely a pH above 9, so that's a base. Now, all of our most, hmm, I'm going to say most of our cleaning products that we have at home, they're bases. Okay, most cleaning products are bases.
All right. Right along that, I went to looking for a cleaning product. And I don't know if you guys know what Windex is. All right. So Windex is a, it's that spray stuff and it's a glass cleaner. All right. So I got a little bit of that and I thought, hey, let's see what this does. All right. So we'll start with, let's start with our pH paper. Oh, and I dropped it in there. That's a problem. Oops. Call me an idiot. All right, well, you can definitely see that it's somewhere around nine. All right, so that's definitely a base. Okay, let's uh, let's try, oh, look at that. It came off in the solution. Let's see what phenolphthalein does. Oh, it's turning pink. All right, so that's gotta be nine or above. Okay, so there's, okay, this is telling me that it's a base. All right, so those are some regular some regular products from around the house. I do have some sodium hydroxide and some hydrochloric acid. So I have a strong base and a strong acid. Right. Now, this should be what color in phenolphthalein? Well, phenolphthalein is going to turn pink in this. And what is it going to be in this one, in the HCl? HCl, it's going to be clear. Okay. Now... I'm going to use some universal indicator for both of these. All right, so let's put some universal indicator. All right. So here's my NaOH, this is my HCl. So if we look at my HCl, right, it's probably right down near one, maybe between one and two. And then this one is way up here around a pH of 12. Okay. So definitely a very strong base, a very strong acid. Well, what happens if we start mixing these? Okay, so what happens if I start, um, adding a little bit of base to this. So the base is reacting with the acid. Oh, I hope I have a big enough beaker. So my pH is still really low. Well, I don't know if I'm going to have a big enough beaker. I went and got another beaker. I'm going to pour this in here. I'm starting to run out of this base, but I have more. All right, so we're going to keep adding this. Since you can see that it's getting lighter. I'm trying to do this slowly so we can see what happens over time. Ooh. 
So now this is still NaOH, so I'm going to start with this dropper bottle because I want to be more precise. So let's go ahead and add this but drop by drop. Let's see what happens to our color. Oh, it went too fast. Hold on. <laughs> so it went to that green color just for fun. Oh, look here. It's, it's settling down in yellow. So we've gone from way down here. So now we're somewhere probably right around neutral now. Maybe a little towards eight. So we've reacted all of that H plus and OH minus and it went to neutral but then it went to eight. So I'm gonna add a little bit of, a little bit more I'm gonna add another drop just to see what happens. Ooh. All right now we're in blue. Okay so now we're in that blue color so we have more OH minus than H plus. Let's add one more drop of NaOH. So the amount of OH minus is increasing, the H plus is decreasing, and then we get up here towards purple. Now, what, what's going to happen to this solution's pH if I add the acid back? And this is hydrochloric again. All right, so I'm adding H pluses in again. So I added some couple drops and it's bringing us right back down here towards seven. If I add another drop, it's going to bring us way down. We're still near seven, so that's probably probably got equal amounts of H plus and OH minus in it right now. And now we're way down towards the red side. All right, so this is an example of universal indicator and it lets us play with pH all the way through the range. I thought that was kind of cool and I just wanted to show it to you. All right, so we can use table M to figure out pHs of different substances. All right. Now there are a couple substances that I want to quick run through that don't uh, don't look like acids or bases, but are. So there are two of them. I well, more than two, but the first one I want to talk about is ammonia. Ammonia, which is NH3, is a base. And it's what's called a weak base, but it's a base, which means it produces OH minus. Now it doesn't look like it produces OH minus, but it does. It does it in a weird way. When we take NH3 and put it in water, what happens is it steals one of the H's. Okay? It steals one of the H's and it produces NH4 plus aqueous. But what's left? In OH minus. Right? So it's doing it in a weird way. It is producing OH minus, which makes it a base. It just does it in a weird, weird way. You need to remember that ammonia is a base, and we're gonna, it's a special base that we're going to talk about why this happens later, but I wanted to bring that up here. Now the other one, other ones I should talk about are, are organic acids, and I know we haven't talked about organic chemistry yet. 
right? It's one of my favorite subjects. And I know we haven't talked about it yet, but there are what are called organic acids. Now, organic molecules are molecules with carbon atoms. And the one that you probably know the most is C6H12O6. Right, this is glucose. It's an organic molecule. Here's my carbons. Okay, So this is an example of an organic molecule. Now, there are organic molecules that are acids. Oops. These are organic molecules that produce H pluses in solution. So they produce these H pluses, so it's an acid. So now you're going to see them in a couple different ways. So you're going to see this one, HC2H3O2. Here's all my carbons, so this is an organic. Right? This is an example of an organic acid. If you see H's in front of an or, uh, something like this, this is an acetate ion, okay, that H is going to come off and it will produce H plus and C2H3O2 minus. Right? So this is an acid. Now there's another way to write this acid. We can write it this way, CH3, COOH. These two things are the same things and when we get into organic, We'll talk about why. Right? If you see an organic compound, why is it organic? It has carbons in it. But if you ever see CO, C O O H, that tells us that it's an organic acid and it will produce H plus in solution. Right? So if you see CO, right? if you see CO, it's an organic acid. So now there's lots of them. We could do uh, C2H5COOH. That's another organic acid. How do you know it's an organic acid? Cuckoo! Right? So I just, you just need to recognize organic acids as acids, and they produce H. Now in our organic acid, this is the H that comes off right here on the end. Right? So in our organics or in our CO, this end H comes off and that's what produces our H plus. All right. Um, so let's talk about Molar ion concentration of acids and bases. Molar ion concentration. Right. So let's look at HCl. If I take HCl solid and I put it in water, this is going to break up and it's going to produce H plus aqueous and Cl minus aqueous. It produces H pluses. So for every one HCl we have, it produces one H plus. Well, if I have one mole of HCl and I dissolve it in water, it will produce one mole of H plus ions. So this, this acid has a one to one ratio. Okay. For every one HCl molecule, it produces one H plus. So, just for fun, let's say that we have 2.5 moles of HCl. Well, because it's a 1 to 1 ratio, it will produce 2.5 moles of H plus ions. 
right? This is called a monoprotic acid. It's called a monoprotic acid. Well, why monoprotic? Well, what does mono mean? Mono means one. Protic, proton. Okay, remember, an H plus is just a proton. So monoprotic acids will produce one proton. Monoprotic acids will produce one proton. HCl is an example of a monoprotic acid. Another example of a monoprotic acid would be uh, HBr. HBr is a monoprotic. It will break into an H plus and a Br minus. Right? So for every one of these, we get one of these. All right, let's look at NaOH. If I take NaOH solid, it will dissolve and it will break into ions and we'll get an Na plus and an OH minus. For every one NaOH molecule, we get one OH minus ion. So for every one mole of NaOH, we get one mole of OH minus. Again, we have this one-to-one -one ratio. We have a one-to-one -one ratio. This is called a monohydroxy base. Okay. A monohydroxy base. Why mono? One hydroxy OH minus. Right. So let's say that I have, I don't know, 4.67 moles of NaOH. How many moles of OH minus ions will I get? Well, it's a one-to-one -one ratio. I would get 4.67 moles of OH minus. Uh, another monohydroxy base would be ammonia, NH3. Now remember, we just did this one. For every one ammonia atom, we get one OH minus. So this is another example of a monohydroxy base. All right. Let's talk about something called a diprotic acid. Well, let's break it apart. Di means two, protic means protons. So these are acids that produce two protons in a solution. So an example is H2SO4. Both of these H's are gonna come off, so we're gonna form two H pluses and an SO4 minus two. So in this case, for every one H2SO4, we get two H pluses. These always have a one to two ratio. They have a one to two ratio. So if I have, let's say that I have 3.5 moles of H2SO4, how many moles of H plus would I get? Well, I would get twice that because it's a set one to two ratio so I would get seven moles of H plus ions all right well we have dihydroxy bases also let's break it apart di means two hydroxy means OH minus so these produce two hydroxide ions. MgOH2 is an example. 
it will produce an mg plus 2 and two OH minuses. Again, this has that 1 to 2 ratio. Another one, calcium hydroxide, CaOH2. That's dihydroxy. It's got two OH minuses. So let's say that I have, I don't know, uh, 2.1 moles of calcium hydroxide. How many OH minus ions would I get? Well, I would get twice that, so I would get 4.2 moles of OH minus. Now there's one more, and there aren't many of these. So we talked about monoprotic and monohydroxy, diprotic, dihydroxy. What do you think's next? Triprotic acids and trihydroxy bases. Can you guess what the ratio for these is? Good. These are one to three ratios. Okay, we break it apart. Tri means three. Protic means protons, or H pluses, and three OH minuses. Uh, now, an example of a triprotic acid is phosphoric, H3PO4. Phosphoric acid will break into three H pluses and a PO4 minus three. So this is one example of a triprotic acid. There are very, very few trihydroxy bases. Okay, matter of fact, almost none. Aluminum hydroxide will sometimes act like a trihydroxy base. Okay, so it will produce an Al plus three and three OH minuses. All right, but there are very few trihydroxy bases. We're gonna need these in our titration problems. We're going to need these in our titration problems. All right. Hopefully everyone can understand how to figure out if they're monoprotic, diprotic, or triprotic. You're going to look at how many H pluses or OH minuses it's going to produce. All right, so our last topic of the day is called titration. And a titration is the process of adding measured volumes of acid or base of a known concentration until neutralization occurs. Okay, neutralization occurs at a pH of 7. Now, if we wanted to, we could actually do uh, a titration to other endpoints or other pHs other than 7, but generally we're looking for a pH of 7. So really what we do for titration, okay, titration is used to find the concentration of an unknown acid or base. So for example, we know that this is a base. This is bleach, this is that bleach, right? And it's that, it's a yellow color. So anyways, so if I wanted to figure out the concentration of OH minus in here, I could do what's called a titration. Okay. And there's a formula. M A V A I C A equals M B V B. I, C, B. Okay, six total variables. Three on the left, 
three on the right. So let's run through them real quick. MA stands for molarity of the acid. VA is volume of acid. ICA is the ionization constant of the acid. And we'll talk about how to come up with that. You already know how to do it. MB is the molarity of the base. VB is volume of base. And ICB is my ionization constant of the base. And again, you already know how to do that. You don't know it, but you do. All right, so we got molarity of the acid, volume of the acid, ionization constant of the acid, molarity of the base, volume of the base, and the ionization constant of the base. MAVA ICA equals MBVB ICB. Now, let's talk about the ionization constant. Okay, the ionization constant is based on that, is based on the ratio of H plus or OH minus produced. But well, we just went over. So for example, HCl. This is monoprotic. It produces one H plus. Well, if it produces one H plus, its ionization constant is one. How about H2SO4? This is diprotic. It will produce two H pluses. What's its ionization constant then? It's going to be two. How about H3PO4? It produces three H pluses. What will its ionization constant be? It will be three. The bases work the same way. Uh, how about LiOH? That's a base. It's monohydroxy. Okay, it only has one OH, so it produces one OH minus. So what's its ionization constant? It would be one. How about NaOH? It's monohydroxy. It produces one OH minus. Okay, its ionization constant would be one. How about uh, strontium hydroxide, SROH2. Well, it produces two OH minuses. It's a one to two ratio. So its ionization constant would be two. So the ionization constant is easy to figure out. It's either going to be one, two, or three. Most of the time, it's going to be one. It could be two. It will almost never be three. Okay. Usually it's, usually it's one, but sometimes it's two. So you just have to be able to figure that out real quick. Now, this is the math that we do. Okay. So we actually have equipment that we have to use. Okay. And these are called burettes. I'm going to show you one in a minute. I'm actually going to show you the whole setup. Right. Actually, let's show it to you right now. Okay, I'm going to rock you around a little bit, okay? So here we go. I'm going to take you. Here we go. This is my workshop, by the way. All right, so we're going to come over here. Don't get dizzy. Oh, there's my table saw. This right here are two burettes. All right, and this is the setup. Let's turn it this way. Huh. Okay. Okay. This is the setup that we use for titration. Now, the one on the left, on the top, you'll see red on it. That means acid, blue means base. All right, now, at the bottom, there are some valves. You see the valves? The one on the left is orange and the one on the right is blue. Okay, those control the amount of acid going out of the burettes. Now I'm going to zoom in real close so that you can actually see. All right, so these are graduated. All right, and the zero is up here. Ooh, sorry. 
the zero, which you can't see because it won't focus, there it goes, the zero is on the top, all right, and it goes all the way down here to 50. Okay, and those are exact volumes of milliliters. Okay, so we're going to be using burettes okay, to help us in our titrations. And we're going to do a lab of this. Okay, or at least I'm going to try. Oop, let's come back over here. Okay. All right. So now. Let's say that I have a solution of HCl and I don't know its concentration. Okay. I don't know its concentration. I want to figure out its con concentration. The one that we don't know is called the analyte. Okay, the analyte. So I'm I'm going to do a titration to figure out the concentration of the HCl. So I take the HCl and I pour it into my burette. Okay, so here's my acid. This is my HCl. So I pour it in here and I draw it all the way up to 50 milliliters. Right? I need a base that I know its concentration. So let's say I use whoop, not that one. Let's say my base is going to be one molar NaOH. And I just choose it. It can be anything. Okay, the one that I know everything about is called the titrant. It's called the titrant. The one that we know everything about is called the titrant. The one that we're trying to figure out is the analyte. The one we're trying to figure out is the titrant. So we're going to take my titrant, the one that I know, and put, a, put it over here, NaOH. And we know that this is 1.0 molar, so we fill this one up. Then what we do, then what we do is we're going to take some of the analyte and we're going to put it in a, a Erlenmeyer flask. And we're going to put it in an Erlenmeyer flask, and we're going to put a specific amount in here. And usually we make it a nice even number, right? So we're going to add how about 10.0 milliliters of HCl into here. Okay, so we put 10 milliliters of HCl in there. And then we're going to put an indicator in here that changes color around 7. Okay, so if we use table M, Probably a good one would be bromothymol blue because it changes between 6 and 7.6, right? Uh, we often use phenolphthalein. I know it's a little high, all right, but we often use phenolphthalein in titrations too. So we put so we put an indicator in here that changes around 7. So if we put the bromothymol blue in there right now, it would be yellow color. And then we bring this over here underneath the base, and we slowly add enough base to neutralize the acid. So we drip, 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 drip here, and eventually this starts to change from yellow to blue, and at that point we stop. Okay, and we measure how much base we use. So let's say that we used, I don't know, 37.8 milliliters. of the NaOH. Well now, now we can go ahead and we can figure out what the what the concentration of this acid was by using MaVaIca equals MbVbIcB. So let's go ahead and fill in what we know. What was the molarity of the acid? Well that's what we're trying to figure out. We don't know it. That's our X. What volume of acid did we use? We used 10 milliliters. What's the ionization constant of HCl? Well, it's monoprotic, so it's one. Right. Molarity of the base, we used 1.0 molar. 
our volume of base was 37.8 milliliters and our ionization constant well NaOH is monohydroxy so it's also a 1 so we have 10x equal to 37.8 so x equals 3.78 molar this right here is our molarity of the HCl. Okay, that would be our concentration. Okay, 3.78 molar. And this is how a titration works. So let's try one more typical problem and we'll call it a day. How many milliliters of 5.0 molar calcium hydroxide are needed to neutralize 63.0 milliliters of 2.0 molar HBr. Okay. So this is a titration problem. We're neutralizing in an acid and a base. So we're going to add um, we're going to neutralize these together. So we're going to use MAVAICA equals MBVBICB. So let's fill in. MA is the molarity of our acid. There's our acid, HBr. So it's 2.0 molar. The volume of our acid is 63.0 milliliters. Right now, what's the ionization constant of HBr? Is it mono, di, or tri? It's mono, so that means it's one. Okay, molarity of our acid we know, 5.0 molar. We wanna know how much of this we need to neutralize this, so that's my X. And then what's my ionization constant? Well, this is a dihydroxy base, so it's a two. All right, so this is, let's see, do this 126 equals 10x. So x equals 12.6 milliliters. So I would need 12.6 milliliters of the calcium hydroxide to neutralize that acid. Okay, and that's just a typical problem. All right, that's where we're going to end for today. All right, uh, and I will see you next class.